Hello everyone, this is MRI Physics Part 1 of 3 lectures, and this recording is mainly for those who missed my lecture earlier, so I hope you find this recording helpful. As a disclaimer, all the images I'm going to show you, of course, has been fully de-identified to protect patient privacy. Also, I am a radiologist. I am no MR physicist. So if you tune in expecting to uh, see a bunch of complex equation and to explain MRI in a much more comprehensive way, but I'm afraid this is not that kind of lecture. Anyway, let's start with part one, signal generation. Let's start with a case. Their indication here is 45-year-old guy with AMS, rural metastasis. There are multiple images, T1, T1 post contrast, flare, and GRE. As you can clearly see, there are multiple intraaxial lesions with variable amount of edema on flare. When you look at GRE, there is no susceptibility artifact. Based on these images, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? And what's your differential diagnosis? In this particular report, the impression is there are multiple scatter enhancing intraaxial lesions with intrinsic T1 shortening and surrounding T2 prolongation consistent with hemorrhagic metastases with edema. Now, do you agree with that assessment 100%? Why or why not? For our clinical colleagues, some of the terminology that we use is confusing. For example, what is T1 shortening? What is T2 prolongation? If there's T1 shortening, is there a T1 prolongation? Is there a T2 shortening? And what is T1? What is T2? Those are the language that we use all the time in our report. So I think it's a fair game for them to ask us. And as a radiologist, are you able to define those terms? Let's come back to this case at the end of the lecture. When you look at the image formation, for the purpose of, say, detection of a small lesion, there are multiple steps that you have to go through first before you can achieve that purpose. First of all, you need to have a signal. Now, having signal itself is not very useful if you don't know where the signal is coming from. Is it coming from patient's left? Is it coming from patient's right? Then you need to have different type of resolution. The first resolution you need is a good spatial resolution. Otherwise, the image will look very blurry or pixelated, and there's no hope to detect the small lesion. Also, you need to have a good contrast resolution the lesion has to look different from the normal tissue. Otherwise, you cannot detect the lesion. Some special studies require temporal resolution, which means that you need to have ability to scan fast enough. The example would be conventional angiogram. You need to be able to image fast enough to chase the contrast from arterial phase to capillary phase to venous phase. There are just a couple of basic definitions that we need to go through. Vector, electromagnetism, quantum physics, I'm going to pretend I actually know some quantum physics, something called echo, frequency, and phase. Vector, remember vector is pretty easy. There's a direction, there's magnitude. The size of arrow signifies the magnitude. Vector could be in different plane. It can be in the z-axis, x-axis, and of course it can be in oblique axis. In that case, you can break them down into component vectors, and those component vectors are additive. Electromagnetism or Faraday's law. You have magnetism, electric charge, and motion. Combine any of the two elements, you can induce a third. For example, if you run an electric current through a loop of wire, you have electric charge plus magnetism that would generate the third element motion. That's how electric motor works. Do it in reverse. You have motion, so moving magnet can generate electricity. That's how hydroelectric dam works. If I show you a picture equipment, it's called SRM. The picture itself does not tell you what this machine does. If I tell you it stands for sushi rolling machine, the name itself is quite self-explanatory, isn't it? What if I show you another equipment called MRI? Again, the picture itself doesn't really tell you what the machine does. But if I tell you that it stands for magnetic resonance imaging, then you can guess that it has something to do with magnetism, resonance, and produced image. So in some way, the name itself is also kind of self-examinatory. So let's look at the first part, M, magnetism. As it turns out, we need two types of magnet, one large, one tiny. The large magnet is found in the MRI machine. You put a specimen in, 
you have a very strong magnetic field along the longitudinal axis of the specimen, so that's B0. By convention, that's designated as a Z axis. 90 degree to that, you have the X and Y axis, the transverse axis. In the textbook, you flip it up. So the Z axis along the main magnetic field, B0. And 90 degree, you have transverse magnetization, X and Y. So those are the large magnets. What about the tiny magnets? MR active atoms. Recall atom comprised of nucleus and electrons. Electron really doesn't contribute much to MR imaging, so we are going to ignore it. Nucleus comprised of positively charged protons plus neutrons. Neutron has no charge. Together, they form the mass number. Imagine proton is spinning in one direction and neutron in the opposite direction. When you have the same number of proton and neutron, their spins cancel each other out. Therefore, you have no net spin. This type of atom is not MR active. On the other hand, if you have an equal number of proton and neutron, their spins do not cancel each other out. Now you have a net spin and produce something called spin angular momentum. So think of spin motion plus positive charge proton. Now you have a magnetism. If you come across a question on board exam asking you which of the following are MR active atoms, the one that you want to pick is the ones that comprise of different numbers of proton and neutron. So you have an odd atomic mass number. Sodium, for example, can be used for MR imaging. Helium, for example, two proton, two neutron. So there's no net spin. Therefore, helium is not an MR active atom. When we talk about clinical MR imaging, we are talking about imaging of the hydrogen atom. Why hydrogen atom? First of all, it's an atom that comprises of a single positively charged proton without neutron. So it has a very strong NMR effect. More importantly, it is also the most abundant atom in human body. Recall 70% of us comprise of water, lots of fat. So there are lots of hydrogen atoms to be had. In textbook, the term hydrogen atom, proton, spin are pretty much interchangeable. If you look at a diagram drawing hydrogen atom, all of them will look something like this. You have a positive charged particle that's spinning its own axis, and there's a north and south pole. Notice that all of them are drawn in a slightly tilted direction rather than straight up. We will come back to this point in a little bit. So that's a drawing for hydrogen atom, positively charged proton, spinning on its own axis with a north and south pole, just like a tiny magnet. Like a tiny magnet, if you place it under a very strong magnetic field, they will become magnetized. The only difference is that some of them will align in a parallel direction, which is in a lower energy state. Some of them will be aligned in the anti-parallel direction, which is higher energy state. Just know that a slight majority of them will align in a parallel state in a low energy state. So the representative proton, when under a strong magnetic field, would align in a parallel direction, like that. A second motion will also induce if a hydrogen atom is placed under a strong magnetic field. So it's spinning on its own axis, it would also start to revolving around the external axis of B0. So we start to go around the external axis of the B0. This motion of revolving around the external axis of B0 is called precession. The analogy a lot of textbooks will use is a spinning top. Notice that spinning top is spinning on its own axis, but it's also revolting around an external axis, kind of like a hydrogen atom does. There is a precise frequency that can be calculated using Lamarck's equation. This is one of the few equations that you need to know. Lamarck's equation or Lamarck's frequency can be calculated using general magnetic ratio, which is a constant that you can look up in a table, times magnetic field B0. As you can see, there is a linear relationship between Lamarck's frequency and magnetic field. If the field strength is increased, for example, from 1.5 tesla to 3 tesla, perceptional frequency will increase. So the linear relationship is very important. That makes it very predictable and also easily calculatable. When you look at the table, under 1.5 tesla, a hydrogen atom would process roughly at 64 megahertz. So this is a question that coming directly off RSNA module. 
Lamont's frequency of hydrogen at three Tesla equals, plug in the number, the answer is D, roughly 130 megahertz. At 1.5 Tesla, the hydrogen atom is processing at roughly 64 megahertz. Another way to present it, there's a patient lying on the MRI table. Before you turn on any gradient, you should have a homogeneous magnetic field across the entire specimen. So the hydrogen proton in the head region, torso region, and the feet region should experience the same strength as 1.5 Tesla. All the protons from head to toe should be processing at roughly 64 megahertz. Now, if you have a gradient, the perception of frequency is going to be different depending on the field strength. In this example, the head region has a stronger gradient, the toe region has a weaker gradient, the hydrogen atom will be processing faster in the head region and much slower in the feed region. And toward the center, it did not change. That's the ISO center, and you can find that in the middle of MRM. So Lamar's frequency is extremely important for MR imaging. Perception of frequency is linearly proportional to the strength of B0. When you think about a human body, you know that there's lots of hydrogen atoms, so therefore you expect to see some electricity or voltage. Let's say you have, you have some kind of portal antenna that can pick up voltage. You expect to pick up some voltage, right? Turns out there's no signal. Why is that the case though? You do have lots of hydrogen atoms. However, they are pointing in all different directions. For every proton that's pointing to the right, you have another one that's pointing to the left, one point up, another one point down. So it's all randomly oriented and they all cancel each other out. What if you place the specimen within a very strong magnetic field? In that case, all the atoms will be magnetized. Surely you should get some signal, right? Again, no signal. Why is that? So even though you have lots of hydrogen atoms, they are minuscule compared to the main magnetic field of MRI. So no matter what you do, because they are in the same orientation, you cannot overcome the large magnetic field you cannot pick up any signal in the longitudinal plane. So you need to flip them from a longitudinal plane to transverse magnetization. Once you do that, now you can get signal. So the take home message, in order for you to generate voltage or a signal, you need to have transverse magnetization. Otherwise, you're not gonna get any signal. Random question number one, when is JFK assassinated? 1963. 1963. Now we know that we need to flip protons from longitudinal magnetization into transverse magnetization to get signal. How do we do that? This is the second part R comes in, resonance, a very effective way to transfer energy. An analogy that textbook like to use is music. So if you have a two type of tuning fork, if they have exactly a matching vibration frequency, if you vibrate the first fork, you don't need to physically touch the second fork, they will resonate because their vibrational frequency matches each other and the energy will get transferred effectively. On the other hand, if their vibrational frequency does not match, you need to physically touch the second fork before the second fork will vibrate. Resonance, effective way of transferring energy, you need to have matching frequency. You have a 1.5 Tesla. The perception of frequency for hydrogen atom here is about 64 megahertz. You decide to send in an RF pulse at say 60 megahertz instead of 64. What would happen? Nothing. The hydrogen is essentially blind to the energy you try to send in because there's no resonance. Now if you send in a 70 megahertz RF pulse, what would happen? Again, nothing. Their frequency do not match, no resonance. Finally, you send in a RF pulse at 64 megahertz. Now there's resonance. Proton will begin to absorb energy, allow them to flip from longitudinal magnetization to the transverse orientation where you start to get signal. What if you shut off the RF pulse? By law of energy conservation, Protons in the high energy state do not like that, so they will release the energy back into the environment and relax back to the longitudinal magnetization to a lower energy state. The environment is also referred to as lattice, so the whole interaction is referred to as spin lattice interaction. You shut off the RF pulse, the protons release the energy back to the environment 
and you re relax back longitudinally. Let me show you again. Notice that the signal disappear much faster in the transverse plane than the signal generate in the longitudinal plane. In other words, transverse relaxation happens much faster than T1 recovery. So the trajectory actually look like this, not that. This curve implies that the degree of transverse magnetization loss is proportional to the degree of longitudinal magnetization gain. That's not what's happening. The transverse decay happens much faster than the longitudinal recovery. This process, by the way, from spin to environment is called spin lattice interaction. So T1 relaxation is also referred to as spin lattice interaction. Now we can draw a T1 graph, look like this. On the x-axis, you have time. On the z-axis, you have percentage of longitudinal relaxation or longitudinal magnetization. You can also measure longitudinal magnetization by signal intensity. So the z-axis is also a signal by signal intensity. Right after you give 90 degree RF pulse, all the protons are in the transverse magnetization, and there's 0% longitudinal magnetization. As time goes on, certain population of the protons regain longitudinal magnetization in an exponential way. If you waited long enough, 100% of the proton will be back in the longitudinal magnetization. So at 63%, remember 1963, JFK was assassinated? Definition of T1 is the time it takes for 63% of the proton to recover longitudinal magnetization. Different tissue has different T1 recovery time. For example, fat will recover much faster than CSF. Therefore, fat has much shorter T1 time than CSF. Remember, the percentage of the longitudinal recovery also translates into signal intensity. So when you have a shorter time on T1 weighted image, it's going to be brighter on T1. So therefore, fat has T1 shortening compared to CSF. You know fat looks bright on T1 weighted image, CSF looks dark. And we can utilize these differences in recovery time to give us T1 contrast. If you look at this T1 weighted images right here, see there are actually brain and a lesion that you try to detect. Let's say brain has a T1 recovery curve look like this, has a specific T1 time. Now another group of tissue called meningioma, essentially an identical curve. Any point along the curve, there's no separation in signal intensity between brain and meningioma. So before contrast, it's very, very difficult to pick up meningioma. What if we can find a substance like gadolinium, which has a significantly shorter T1 time than brain and meningioma, which is a macromolecule that cannot escape through intact blood-brain barrier. Therefore, gadolinium will not seep into normal tissue, but it does into meningioma. So we are imaging the curve of gadolinium. Now you have a very nice contrast on T1 weighted image. So on post contrast, you can see gadolinium lights up. That's how we utilize the differences in T1 curve to give us the ability to detect the lesion. So T1 shortening, shifting the curve to the left, make it brighter on T1 weighted image. By the way, why do we call RF pulse, radio frequency pulse? It's in the same wavelength as radio wave. And that's the reason why when you construct a brand new MRI suite, you want to put in Faraday's cage or RF shielding to block out those unwanted external radio waves. What happens if you don't have a good RF shielding? Sometimes due to defect in the RF shielding, more commonly due to door to the MRI suite is not sealed properly, you will get this zipper artifact. Another common cause is interference wave coming from the electronic monitoring equipment that's brought in with a patient. Earlier we mentioned that proton is slightly tilted and is revolving around the external axis of B0. Some of you may have already noticed that if it's tilted not exactly parallel to B0, shouldn't there be a small transverse magnetization? Therefore, you should be picking up small signal. The answer is that for everyone that's tilted to the right, you have its counterpart that's tilted to the left. So their transverse component essentially cancel each other out you'd have a representative vector that's parallel to the direction of B0. Again, you, you give a RF pulse in the same frequency as the hydrogen atom. You flip them into transverse plane and they begin to process at 64 megahertz. Initially, everybody is flipped into transverse plane. They will process all in sync. Remember, this is a representative arrow that represents lots of different protons. 
So when you put a detector, you can detect a voltage going from positive voltage to negative voltage. Initially, maximum positive voltage. As the protons spin away, the voltage decreases to zero, then to negative voltage. Then they come back up and produce a regular sine wave with a specific precession of frequency. That is what you expect. In reality, while initially all the protons are processing in phase, very quickly they begin to deface. In this diagram, the proton A is going to process just slightly faster than its neighbor. Proton Z becomes the slowest. All the protons are out of phase, and you quickly lost transverse magnetization. This process is referred to spin-to-spin -spin interaction. There are complex explanations as to why this happens. Why does some proton decide to go faster? Some proton becomes slower. The one that I can easily understand is imagine that all the protons are processing at the same frequency, processing at 64 megahertz. So they have the same frequency, and they start to resonate with each other. Imagine A is getting a little more energy from its neighbor, and Z is giving out more energy to its neighbor. So the A is experiencing slightly more local magnetic field. Therefore, its Lamarck frequency is just a little bit faster than its neighbor, vice versa for Z. The interactions between spin to spin, not spin to lattice like T1. So instead of seeing a regular sine wave that goes on for a long time, you very quickly have transverse magnetization decay. This place is referred to free induction decay. It's not very useful for signal generation. By the way, that curve is T2 star curve. So again, if you draw a graph, X signifies the time. Starting point is 100% transverse magnetization. As protons start to go in our phase with each other, you have transverse magnetization decay, loss of transverse magnetization. And the definition is T2. It's the time it takes for 63%, again, 1963. The time it takes for 63% of the proton to lose their transverse magnetization. Another way to look at it is the time it takes for 37% proton remain in phase. And that also translates into signal intensity. So initially, you have 100% of signal. And as time goes on, you quickly lost the signal. Different tissue also have a different T2 decay curve. TSF, for example, has the longest T2 time compared to other tissue. On brain MRI, CSF is the brightest substance within the image because it has longest T2 time. So T2 prolongation means hyperintensity on T2 weighted image. So that's T2 curve. As it turns out, there's actually another curve that's making transverse decay even faster. That's T2 star curve. T2 curve should be constant for a given tissue. There's no way to slow it down. However, there are some additional elements that cannot be controlled that's causing increased inhomogeneity of the magnetic field, causing protons to go out phase with each other even faster than T2 curve. That's not good if our goal is to generate as much signal as possible. So what are these additional factors that's causing increased inhomogeneity across the field? Why do protons experience slightly different magnetic field strength? Even though the main field B0 is supposed to be homogeneous across the whole specimen. For one thing, a biologic specimen comprises many different tissues, bone, brain, CSF, muscle, fat, etc. So intrinsically, there's going to be slight variation in the local magnetic field due to different tissue types. Even if you have one single tissue, because we have various shape, there's slight variability in the local magnetic field just based on the differences in shape. And even if you have a homogeneous cube that's full of exactly the same tissue, the proton right in the center of the specimen and the proton just right at the edge of the specimen against air is going to experience slightly different local magnetic field. Therefore, you have inhomogeneity of the field causing T2 star decay. If I have a sample and I major in my machine, I get a specific T2 value and a T2 star value based on the particular machine I have. If I send a sample across town, they should have an identical T2 value, but have a different T2 star value because we're using different machine and maybe they have a better calibration than my machine and other factors, including temperature that we cannot control or predict. So you have a transverse decay and you have even a faster decay curve, the T2 star curve underneath. 
your signal is going to loss even faster. Is there a way we can temporarily shift the T2 star curve back to T2? Yes, we can. We can do this by using a technique called Spinnacle, one of the building blocks for MR imaging. What is an echo? It was credit to this person. Initially, when they were doing the experiment, what they find was this very quick loss of transverse signal, free induction decay. That is useless to capture any signal. What they found is that when they give a second RF pulse, just when they thought the signal was completely gone, a second signal reappeared in a symmetric crescendo decrescendo fashion, look like an echo. Notice that the peak of the echo is always going to be lower than the initial signal free induction decay. As it turned out, you know exactly when the peak of the echo will occur. You just sample symmetrically before and after it to sample across an echo to capture signal. Let's say you're a photographer taking a picture of a ski jump. You can take one single picture at the peak of the jump, but that doesn't show you the entire picture. If you know where the peak of the jump is going to be, and you just take pictures symmetrically before and after, then you can see the entire trajectory. And that's how you sample the entire arc. So you sample the entire echo, determine where the peak is going to be, sample symmetrically before and after of entire echo to capture signal. In this very simple diagram, you start with a 90 degree RF pose, you flip all the proton from longitudinal magnetization to transverse magnetization, and you develop signal, but the signal decay really fast and disappear, as seen free induction decay. At a later point, you give a 180 degree RF pose. You will get an echo at the equal amount of time between 90 and 180 degree RF pose. Because you know when echo peak will occur, you can sample the echo symmetrically before and after the peak. So the time between the 90 degree RF post to the peak of echo is TE, time to echo or echo time. And you sample across, that's acquisition window or sampling window. How fast you can sample is depend on your machine. The more sample that you take, that gives you a larger matrix, which we will talk about in the second lecture. So you can use 180 degree to control the length of your TE from 90 degree RF pulse to the peak of the echo. If you want to have a short TE, you just give 180 degree RF pulse earlier. You produce an echo earlier, therefore you're creating a short TE. If you want to have a long TE, you just give 180 degree RF pulse much later, creating a long TE. So you can see an echo is a very powerful mechanism for delay image information. That gives you control to manipulate different parameters like TE, NTR, echo time, and repetition time. Those parameters can control T1 and T2 weighting. So the ability to control echo is also allow you to manipulate different contrast signal intensity. Now we know we can control the timing of the echo. How do we do that? So one way to do it is through a method called span echo. This method is also used to compensate for T2 star effect. In general, this process is slower compared to other methods like gradient echo. This is how you do it. Imagine you have only three protons, red, green, and yellow. Initially, all three protons are processing at exactly the same rate. But soon after, the red one began to go faster than the green one, than the yellow one. They begin to go out of phase with each other. As time goes by, there's greater loss of transverse magnetization because they become out of sync with each other. At a later time, you give another RF pulse. But instead of another 90 degree pulse, this time you give a 180 degree pulse. So you flip the protons like a pancake. You are not reversing their direction, but you flip their position. Instead of red proton leading the race, now the red proton is in the last place. However, red proton still is the fastest one. So the fastest red proton will start to catch up with other two slower proton, and the signal start to increase. At one point, they become in sync again. That's where you see the strongest signal. If you let the race continue, you can imagine the red one is going to overtake other two, and they become out of phase again, then signal starts to decrease. So when you look at an echo, you will see slow increase in signal magnitude, 
reaches a peak and then start to decline in this crescendo decrescendo pattern. An imperfect analogy in the textbook, they use three runners or three different cars. So the red car, the sports car, go faster than the rest of the group and go even faster. And you give 180 degree RF pulse. And this is where the analogy sort of falls apart a little bit. You actually don't reverse the direction of the race. You just flip their position and they begin to catch up with each other. At the starting line, they become in phase again, therefore produce a stronger signal. Perhaps easier to demonstrate animation from Wikipedia. Start off with a 90 degree hour pulse. They begin to go of sync, 180 degree pulse, flip them like a pancake, and you begin to generate signal and echo peak. If you let it go, you, they will start to go out of sync with each other again. So one more time, 90 degree out of pose, begin to go out of sync. 180 degree flip like a pancake, generate a signal. Once again, 90 degree, begin to out of sync. You flip them like a pancake with 180 degree, in phase again, creating an echo. So spin echo is a way that you can temporarily shift the T2 star curve back to T2 curve. Therefore, reduce the susceptibility artifact or reduce the susceptibility to inhomogeneity of the magnetic field. So if you know the specimen has a lot of susceptibility artifact, you want to use spin echo because you do have the 180 degree RF pulse or 180 degree recovery RF pulse. On the other hand, if you want to highlight the susceptibility artifact, for example, try to detect iron particle hemorrhage, you want to use T2 star image like gradient echo. On gradient echo, you can see multiple micro artifacts because you're imaging T2 star. Other areas such as the interface between air and brain tissue. On spin echo, you don't see as much a blooming artifact compared to GRE. That's the main difference between T2 and T2 star curve. One has 180 degree recovery RF pulse and T2 star imaging does not. Let's talk about T1 and T2 weighted image. So recall the graph between T1 recovery and T2 decay and different tissue have different T1 recovery rate and T2 decay rate. Let's imagine that you have a specimen that contains only fat and water. After you give 90 degree RF pulse, you flip everyone into the transverse plane. You watch them do their longitudinal recovery and fat is going to recover much faster than CSF. So at point A, fat is going to recover much faster than CSF. If you wait long enough to point B, you can see that fat has recovered essentially 100% and CSF has recovered near 100%. So the question, if you want to have a good T1 contrast between these two tissues, should you take the picture earlier in the curve or later in the curve, point A or point B? If you waited too long at point B, even though you have a strong signal overall, the differences between signal intensity, differences between their T1 contrast is pretty small. Compare that to if you take the picture early, you have much better T1 contrast. The parameter that's important for T1 weighted image is TR, repetition time. Therefore, if you want to maximize T1 contrast, you want to use short TR. If you want to minimize T1 contrast, you want to use long TR. Let's examine how TR can affect T1 contrast. In this example, we use the same TE, but changes TR from short to long. Initially, if you take the picture too early, very short TR time, the entire picture looks dark because there's not much signal overall. You can see in the second picture, when there's relatively short T1 time, there is a very good T1 contrast between CSF and rest of the brain. The gray white matter differentiation also looks great. If you let TR go very long, you can see that the T1 contrast is lousy, even though the entire picture has much higher signal intensity. Sometimes the signal intensity is not the most important part. More often, it is having good signal contrast between different tissue is what's more important for diagnosis. For T2 weighted image, if you want to maximize T2 contrast, would you like to take a picture early or later? You can see in the graph, the answer is later. If you take the picture too early at point A, 
you did not allow sufficient time for the tissue to separate themselves based on T2 decay. Therefore, in the beginning, even though you have a strong signal overall, the T2 contrast is pretty small. You want to let the rays run a little bit longer so the tissue can separate themselves based on their T2 curve. But you don't want to wait too long though because you're going to lose all the signal. The parameter that's important for T2 weight image is TE. So if you want to maximize T2 contrast, you want to have a longer TE. If you want to minimize T2 contrast, you want to have a short TE. This is the same picture, except this time around, they kept TR constant. At a very short TE, the entire picture has a very good signal intensity. However, the T2 contrast between CSFs and the brain tissue is pretty lousy. As you prolong TE, there's a better T2 contrast. In this example, the longest T at 400 milliseconds, there's tremendous contrast between CSF and tissue. But also notice that the entire image is much darker. So if you want to have T2-weighted contrast, you want to have a longer TE. So let's review what we just talked about. If you want to create a T1-weighted image, remember the parameter that's important for T1-weighted image is TR. What do you need to do? You want to maximize T1 contrast, you want to have a short TR. At the same time, you also want to minimize T2 contribution. You want to have a short TE. For T2 weighted image, the parameter that's important for T2 is TE. To maximize T2 effect, you want to have a long TE. At the same time, you also want to minimize T1 contribution, so you want to have a long TR. There you create a T2 weighted image. What if I have an image sequence look like this? So you have a long TR, that means that you want to minimize T1 weighting. What about short TE? That means that you want to minimize T2 contribution. So what are you trying to do here? You try to minimize T1, try to minimize T2. Well, what's left is that the signal intensity of a given tissue is going to depend on how much proton each tissue has. You'll try to separate tissue between the intrinsic proton density. So you have just created a proton density weighted image. The last point I'd like to make after spent to lattice interaction occur, the trajectory of the longitudinal recovery is going from this direction. The transverse magnetization decay is much faster than the longitudinal magnetization recovery. So in a biological sample, T1 is always going to be longer than T2. Also as a side note, T1 will be dependent on the fuel strength, and T2 much less so. Here in this chart, as you see, for most of the tissue, the T1 value is significantly longer than T2. So the take home message is for most biological tissue, longitudinal relaxation is much longer than transverse decay. The T1 value is always going to be greater than T2. Just so you know, the things that we have just talked about in this lecture, the MRI physics stuff, the parameters TR, TE, all this information is available to you on your image. You can see that this is long TR, this is long TE, this is a T2 weighted image. And on board exam, the beauty about the multiple choice question is that you don't actually have to memorize the exact value. You just have to pick the right combination. If they show you T1 weighted image, pick the combination of the shortest TR and the shortest TE. If they show you T2 weighted image like this, Pick the combination of the longest TR and longest TE. So back to our original image. Impression again reads multiple scatter enhancing interactive lesion with intrinsic T1 shortening and surrounding T2 prolongation, consistent with hemorrhagic metastasis with edema. So what is incorrect about this statement? Well, here T1 shortening doesn't necessarily mean that it's from blood. If you look at GRE, it's negative for susceptibility artifact. So what else can cause T1 shortening? You can have gadolinium, fat, mehemoglobin, blood, and what else? Melanin. So it turns out this is not hemorrhagic metastasis, but rather meds from melanoma. I hope that's not too confusing. And this concludes the first part of the lecture. Thank you.